Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation monthly Meet the Scientist webinar. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Eric Nessler will present a webinar entitled Molecular Mechanisms of Drug Addiction. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research around the world to identify the causes, improve treatments, and ultimately develop cures and preventative techniques for mental illness. The foundation has awarded over $3 million in research grants over the past 25 years. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Eric Nestler. Dr. Nestler is the Nash Family Professor, Chair of the Department of Neuroscience, and Director of the Friedman Brain Institute for the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Nestler studies the molecular basis of addiction and depression in animal models, focusing on the brain pathways that regulate responses to natural rewards such as food, sex, and social interaction. His research has established that drug and stress-induced changes in the reward pathways mediate long-lived behavioral changes relevant to addiction and depression. Dr. Nestler received a NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant in 1996 and identified a novel transcription factor that determines the long-lasting consequences of stress and of several classes of antipsychotic medications on the brain. This work provided a path for novel treatment development efforts for a wide range of psychiatric disorders. Dr. Nestler is also a longstanding member of the Foundation's Scientific Council that identifies the most promising ideas to fund with NARSAD grants each year. This will be an interactive event. We'll start with Dr. Nestler's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab of the webinar control panel. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I will present your questions to Dr. Nestler, and we will address as many as possible. And now, I'm pleased to present Dr. Eric Nestler. Eric, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me here today. Um, as uh, Jeff mentioned, today I'll be giving you an update on what we know about the biology of addiction. And I'd like to start with my first slide, which makes the point that although addiction is obviously a very complicated syndrome with many psychological and social causes, it is at its core also a biological process. The ability of certain physical substances, drugs of abuse, to cause a, an addiction syndrome by acting on a physical substrate, a vulnerable brain. So in terms of understanding addiction, we need to understand two basic types of information as depicted on this first slide. First, we need to identify the pathophysiology of addiction, in other words, understanding how drugs change the brain to cause addiction, and also understand why it is that certain brains are particularly vulnerable, whereas others are particularly resistant to these drug actions. We know, for example, that the risk for addiction is about 50% genetic, even though we still don't know many of those genes involved, with the other 50% of the risk largely non-genetic. And we believe that only through an improved understanding of the biology of addiction will it be possible to develop improved treatments. Just let's start with a few metrics which illustrate the impact that addiction has on our society. About a quarter of the U.S. population has a diagnosis of drug abuse or addiction, and we'll get to this, the criteria for diagnosis in just a few minutes. About half of all high school students use illegal drugs of abuse. The use of alcohol and tobacco is even more common. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse has estimated that the cost of addiction to the United States annually is over $400 billion. One of the first things that becomes apparent when you think about addiction is that only a small number of molecules can cause the syndrome. Out of millions of chemical substances that we know about, only a small handful, when a, when a human takes them uh, repeatedly, can produce an addiction syndrome. And the, 
major types of drugs of abuse are depicted in this slide. When you look at the chemical structures of these drugs, it becomes apparent that what's similar about the drug's effects on the brain is not in their chemical structure. Each of the major types of drugs of abuse that people use have a different, distinct chemical structure, so that even though each of these drugs can cause an addiction syndrome with a lot of similar features, that similarity has to be elsewhere, as we'll see as we move forward. A little bit about the use of uh, drugs in, uh, in the United States. On this slide, I'm including caffeine only for comparison because, as I hope will become apparent, I don't think that caffeine is a drug of abuse. It might cause dependence, but not addiction. The slide shows that alcohol and nicotine, the two legal drugs, are by far more widely used in the United States than any of the illicit substances. So one of the questions we might address at the end of my talk is whether the current legal distinctions between these drugs make sense based on what we know about their neurobiology. Like all psychiatric syndromes, addiction can only be defined or diagnosed based on behavioral abnormalities. There is no blood test, genetic test, or brain scan that we can use today to make a diagnosis of addiction. Rather, addiction has behavioral definitions such as those shown in this slide. Um, addiction can be thought of as a loss of control over drug use, as the compulsive seeking and taking of drug despite horrendous adverse consequences. And one of the cardinal features of addiction that we see clinically is the fact that it is very long-lived. An individual can remain at increased risk for relapse despite years or even a lifetime of abstinence. These are some terms that are used in the addiction field. Tolerance refers to the ability of uh, uh, the reduced effect of a drug when given chronically at the same dose to produce a certain effect. The drug becomes less and less potent. Sensitization can be thought of as reverse tolerance. The opposite happens. The same dose of a drug elicits a greater and greater effect. And dependence and withdrawal, which can be seen as the, the flip sides of the same coin. Dependence is an altered physiological state caused by repeated drug exposure, which is only revealed when the drug is taken away and results in a withdrawal syndrome uh, of, of various features. Now, an important, an important point about addiction is that these terms, per se, cannot be used to define addiction because many non-addictive drugs, even drugs that don't even act on the brain at all, can cause important tolerance, sensitization, or dependence. For that reason, we have to refer to different terms in order to understand how drugs can cause addiction, and these terms are reward and reinforcement. And we believe it is particular responses to drugs, tolerance, sensitization, or dependence in reward-related mechanisms that underlie addiction. So let's define these terms. Reward can be seen as simply something that causes a positive emotional effect. A reinforcement is a very similar thing, only it's a more operational construct, which describes the ability of a stimulus to cause an individual to repeatedly seek that stimulus. There are two types of reinforcement. One is positive, simply an individual repeatedly seeking to obtain the stimulus to get a positive effect. Examples would be food, sex, social interaction, and other positive emotional stimuli. Negative reinforcement is the opposite, where an individual repeatedly does something in order to end something unpleasant. For example, something that would end pain starvation, or other negative emotional experiences. In this way, one can imagine rewards and reinforcements in the environment powerfully shaping all aspects of our behavior. Now, like efforts throughout medicine, in order to understand the basic principles of reward and reinforcement and addiction, we need to turn to laboratory animals. So, is it possible to model these features in animals? The purpose of this slide is to simply emphasize the point that it is not possible to recapitulate all of the complex 
social and psychological features which we know are so crucial for addiction in a laboratory animal. Nevertheless, because addiction is at its core a biological process, it is possible to conceive of very good animal models of addiction, some of which are listed in this slide. Condition place preference describes the ability of an animal to learn to prefer a drug-paired environment and is thought to model some of the important cue conditioning effects of drugs of abuse seen in people. By far the best animal model of addiction involves self drug self-administration. This is where a mouse or rat is placed in a cage where they can press a lever and give a drug to themselves. Mammals being curious will all press the lever, but only a subset of rats or mice will continually press the lever to deliver to themselves a drug of abuse. And in fact, mice and rats will self-administer the same range of drugs of abuse as humans will self-administer. A subset of rats and mice will self-administer the drug and lose control over that self-administration by really any definition used clinically, they will become addicted. In fact, a subset of those animals that become addicted even overdose. Another animal model is called intracranial self-stimulation where an animal will press a lever to deliver electrical current to specific parts of the brain. It is these various animal models of addiction that has made it possible to identify specific parts of the brain which are crucial for the addiction process as shown in this slide. This is a sideways or sagittal cartoon of a human brain illustrating what we call brain reward pathways. Pathways that are important in mediating reward under normal conditions and that are hijacked by drugs of abuse. They focus on dopamine nerve cells located at the base of the brain in an area called the VTA or ventral tegmental area. These nerve cells make the chemical messenger dopamine and send dopamine signals to many parts of the frontal or limbic or emotional brain. For example, what I'll be focusing on today is the most important reward circuit where these dopamine nerve cells send signals to a region called the nucleus accumbens, but also very important are two regions in the temporal lobe called amygdala and hippocampus and broad regions of prefrontal cortex. Dopamine inputs to each of these regions subserve different aspects of the reward experience and the addiction syndrome. In order to appreciate the role of dopamine in reward and addiction, it's useful to, to go back in evolution and consider a very primitive species called roundworms, in particular C. elegans. These worms only have about 300 nerve cells in their entire uh, bodies compared with 100 billion nerve cells in a human. And of these 300 nerve cells, only four or eight are dopamine nerve cells, depending on the sex of the worm, whether they're male or female. The way worms normally eat is that they will swim in a petri dish and uh, until their skin touches clumps of uh, bacteria. And the worms will then engulf the bacteria. When you take a worm and kill these four or eight dopamine nerve cells, but leave all the other nerve cells intact, the behavior of the worm is altered, impaired in a subtle way. The movement of the worm is normal. However, now when the worm's skin touches the clump of bacteria, the worm no longer engulfs the food. So in other words, even in worms going back a, about a billion years in evolution, dopamine neurons were used as the interface between the detection of a required nutrient in the environment and a motor response to consume that reward. If you now fast forward to mammalian systems, dopamine neurons serve a very analogous role, although obviously much more complicated. A human might have, for example, 500,000 VTA dopamine neurons, which we view as rheostats of reward. By this I mean the following. VTA dopamine neurons are activated when an individual is given a reward. As an individual learns to expect a reward, for example, a treat given at the same time every day or in various circumstances, 
just the expectation of the reward is enough to activate the nerve cells. And the absence of the expected reward inhibits the nerve cells. And when an individual is surprised and given an unexpected reward, the neurons are activated to an even greater extent. It is these responses that tell us how dopamine neurons and their responses to rewards in the environment shape all aspects of our behavior. Drugs of abuse act on these dopamine nerve cells with a power and persistence that's simply not seen in the natural world. And they do so without connection to a purposeful behavior, such as eating food or having sex. And it is in this way that we believe drug action on these dopamine neurons eventually corrupts the brain's reward mechanisms by gradually and progressively replacing natural rewards as the major shaper of behavior. And in the extreme, an addict with a severe addiction syndrome will spend his or her entire day seeking and taking their drug of abuse. Now, this is work mainly based from animal animal models, how do we know that the same thing happens in humans? Well, we can use brain imaging tools to evaluate this prospect. This is from a study done several years ago where humans were placed in a brain scanner, particularly a magnetic resonance imaging scanner, to carry out what's called functional MRI, which provides a measure of the activity of nerve cells. Shown in this picture are two uh, images of a human brain. This is a horizontal image, basically a slice going from the top to the bottom of the head. And this is, again, a sagittal or sideways slice. The uh, red area is the ventral tegmental area, this dopamine-rich brain region. People are in the scanners and performing gambling tasks. And when given an unexpected money reward, the activity of the VTA increases, as shown in the green bar. Once they learn the the uh, rules of the game and, and get an expected reward, the VTA is activated, although, although not to the same extent. But when they are deprived of an expected reward, now the VTA activity goes below normal. It is inhibited. A, a, a identical responses as what's seen in laboratory animals. And what we can show is that the responses to drugs of abuse are essentially equivalent to those of natural rewards, only stronger. That's depicted in this other study from a number of years ago, illustrating now activity in the nucleus accumbens, that other brain reward region I mentioned earlier, now showing fMRI scans of, of, of coronal or frontal slices of brain, showing the activation of the nucleus accumbens in response to a money reward and a much more dramatic response to two drugs of abuse, morphine and cocaine. So how is it that drugs of abuse produce these effects? To that, we have to turn to neurobiology and focus in on an area called a synapse. A synapse is the site where two nerve cells touch and communicate. I mentioned earlier that a human brain has about 100 billion nerve cells. Those 100 billion nerve cells form connections or synapses with thousands of other nerve cells all told, a human brain might have 100 trillion synapses. This cartoon shows one synapse. The way nerve cells communicate is that an electrical impulse comes down one nerve cell, where it triggers the release of a chemical substance called a neurotransmitter, depicted by these black dots. These, these neurotransmitter molecules diffuse across this synapse and bind to receptor proteins located on the next nerve cell. The binding of neurotransmitter to receptor then triggers changes in ion channels, proteins that control electrical impulses in nerve cells, leading to electrical changes in the next nerve cell, and so on. All drugs of abuse act at synapses. Many drugs of abuse, listed here, mimic the body's own endogenous neurotransmitter substances. Several other drugs of abuse, particularly stimulants like cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, target what's called the dopamine pump. The dopamine pump is a protein sitting on nerve terminals that make the neurotransmitter dopamine and pump dopamine that's been released into the synapse 
back into the nerve terminal. In other words, the pump turns off the dopamine signal. All stimulant drugs act to impair the function of that pump and increase the levels of dopamine in the synapse. They promote dopamine signaling. Still other drugs of abuse, like alcohol, act directly on the brain's ion channels. This is a very complicated slide, which I will not go over in detail. It is simply to make the point that we can now explain in considerable detail exactly how it is that all drugs of abuse affect this ventral tegmental area dopamine to nucleus accumbens connection. This is a ventral tegmental area dopamine neuron sending a process releasing dopamine onto nucleus accumbens neurons, which make another neurotransmitter called GABA. Many other types of nerve cells also regulate this circuit. The point of this slide is to illustrate that each drug of abuse affects the circuit in a different way. That's consistent with the fact that I mentioned earlier that each drug of abuse has a distinct chemical structure, therefore acts on a distinct initial target. But what's interesting is that all of those actions converge functionally on the same, on producing the same effect on this dopamine circuit. All drugs of abuse will increase dopamine signaling from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens in many different ways. And also, all drugs of abuse will produce similar dopamine-independent effects on these nucleus accumbens nerve cells. But all of these actions that I've been discussing thus far are initial effects of drugs, what drugs do acutely when a person first takes them. And that is not enough to cause addiction. Addiction is required. Addiction is caused by repeated exposure to a drug of abuse. And in order to understand addiction, we have to, therefore, understand how it is that these extracellular actions of drugs are producing effects inside of their target nerve cells. If neurotransmitters are called first messengers, these chemicals inside of nerve cells can be called second, third, fourth chemical messengers, and so on. It is the ability of drugs of abuse to corrupt these intracellular messengers that enable drugs of abuse to change the brain on a longer time scale to cause addiction. This slide puts more scientific terminology on what these intracellular second and third chemical messengers look like. For example, there are second messengers that act largely through protein phosphorylation and regulate many cellular processes inside of nerve cells, including the regulation of gene expression. I'm going to be coming back and explaining what I mean by gene expression and transcription factors in a few moments. But let me emphasize to you how complicated these intracellular messenger pathways are in actuality. Here are three of literally dozens of intracellular messenger pathway cascades that are present inside of all nerve cells. Different neurotransmitters trigger these different intracellular messenger cascades, which form highly complex webs of literally thousands of proteins that control the functioning of nerve cells and, as I'll illustrate, are corrupted by repeated exposure to drugs of abuse. OK, so now let's turn to the chronic actions of drugs of abuse on the brain and how they cause addiction. In general, scientists have identified three main types of functional changes that drugs produce that underlie addiction. Addicts display reduced sensitivity to natural rewards as drugs gradually take over their day-to-day -day lives. At the same time, the same individuals become even more sensitive to drugs of abuse and drug-associated cues, really skewing an addict's view of the world. And overlaid on top of that is impaired control by higher cortical systems over these more primitive reward pathways, leading to a loss of control over drug use. For the purposes of today's lectures, I'm going to illustrate examples of what we know now at the molecular level of how drugs of abuse produce these first two responses. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have after the talk uh, about these other features of addiction. 
first let's let me tell you about one mechanism by w which repeated exposure to certain drugs of abuse reduce the sensitivity of the brain's reward pathway. This cartoon illustrates a normal VTA dopamine neuron innervating a normal nucleus accumbens neuron and what happens to these neurons in the addicted brain. One of the changes that occurs is that there's actual physical shrinkage of these VTA dopamine neurons leading to a profound impairment in the brain's reward systems. So, as, what, as I just said, there is increasing evidence, both in animal models and in human addicts, that long-term exposure to a drug of abuse impairs dopamine neurons, as well as the signals that these dopamine neurons can send to their targets, for example, in the nucleus accumbens, and this dampens natural reward, leaving the addict in an unrewarded state. The easiest way for the addict to replace that missing reward is by taking the drug of abuse. This would be an example of reward tolerance, for example, which I alluded to earlier. And we now know that one key mechanism of reward tolerance of this impairment in brain reward circuits is caused by physical shrinkage, physical impairment of these VTA dopamine neurons. This is work coming from my lab over the last decade or so illustrating this phenomenon in laboratory rats. The two cells on the left show the way dopamine nerve cells look in the brain of a normal rat and how dopamine neurons look in the brain of a morphine addicted rat. Morphine is an opiate drug similar to heroin Oxycontin, Vicodin, and several other opiates that are highly abused by humans. Notice the dramatic shrinkage of these dopamine nerve cells, and importantly, we've since shown the same shrinkage of VTA dopamine neurons in the brains of humans who abuse heroin. Of course, we've examined those brains post-mortem, looking on autopsy. We now have a very good idea of the molecular mechanisms causing that physical shrinkage of the VTA dopamine neurons. And they, uh, this mechanism involves depriving these VTA dopamine neurons of a crucial growth factor called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We've shown, for example, that chronic exposure to certain types of drugs of abuse, opiates in particular, decreases BDNF signaling in the VTA this loss of B BDNF signaling then triggers the uh, physical impairment of VTA dopamine neurons, decreasing their size and impairing their ability to record reward signal. And we've also shown the converse, that when we restore BDNF signaling, we can repair those VTA dopamine neurons and bring their size back to normal and the behavior or behavioral responses to rewards back to normal as well. I'm going to show you some data that illustrate these principles. This is a complicated slide, but I think I can describe it uh, adequately. This is using some of the modern tools of molecular biology where we create genetic mutant mice containing a BDNF gene that is tagged. This tag is called floxed. So we have a floxed BDNF mouse where the mouse is normal only now its BDNF gene is tagged in a way that we can knock out that BDNF gene when we overexpress a protein called Cree recombinase. This is an artificial protein not normally found in mammals, and we express it using a viral vector, adeno-associated virus. So we would take a normal flux BDNF mouse, inject this virus expressing Cree specifically into the ventral tegmental area, enabling us to knock out BDNF and see what happens. This is important because we're knocking out BDNF in adult animal, avoiding any developmental consequences. What's shown in the panels below is the ability of the virus to express this Cree recombinase and the ability of this Cree recombinase to completely obliterate BDNF in this injected area compared to significant BDNF signal located on the uninjected side of the brain. This shows an almost complete knockout of BDNF uh, expression 
by virtue of this AAV Cree vector. And when we take a normal mouse, normal in development, now an adult, never being exposed to morphine, and inject AAV Cree into the VTA, we can show that knocking out BDNF is enough to decrease the size of VTA dopamine neuron. And as I mentioned, we can do the opposite. Now we can treat animals with morphine and see if BDNF can repair the damage. What's shown here is the ability of chronic morphine by itself to decrease the size of VTA dopamine neurons. BDNF by itself has no effect, but when we inject BDNF into the VTA of morphine-treated animals, we can completely restore the normal size of these cells as depicted in the, in the photographs to the left. Now, in this case, the way we're delivering BDNF into the brain, we would see this as a therapy, for example, for addiction, is to drill a hole in the animal's head and inject BDNF physically into the ventral tegmental area. Obviously, that's not an approach that's ready for human use. However, we can take this discovery and explore the complex web of intracellular messenger pathways through which BDNF regulates VTA cell size as depicted in this slide. And each of these proteins depicted in this slide then becomes a viable drug target with which, against which to make novel medications to treat opiate addiction. And I'll come back to that toward the end of my lecture in just a few moments. Let me turn now to one other example of a physical change induced in the brain by chronic exposure to drugs of abuse. While some drugs of abuse cause VTA dopamine neurons to shrink, other drugs of abuse do the opposite to nucleus accumbens neurons. They actually cause the neurons' uh, branches, called dendritic branches, to increase. And that increase in dendritic branching is mediated through changes in gene expression. So now let me return to this slide and say more about what I meant earlier when I said that the actions of drugs of abuse at the synapse eventually signal to regulate gene transcription through transcription factors. Humans, like other mammals, have about 20 or 25,000 genes. Each gene encodes several messenger RNAs. Each messenger RNA encodes several proteins and it's the proteins in the brain that either serve as chemical messengers or make chemical messengers. And the chemical messengers then determine all aspects of normal and abnormal brain function. BDNF, for example, being one of these chemical messengers. Transcription factors are a small number of specialized proteins that control the expression of other proteins. Transcription factors can be considered master control proteins then that determine, for example, the ability of the BDNF gene to be expressed into BDNF and so on. One master control protein or transcription factor that we've demonstrated over the years is crucial for addiction is called delta FOS B. What's shown over here is the unique ability of delta FOS B to be induced in nucleus accumbens after chronic non-acute exposure to a drug of abuse, in this case cocaine. What's shown in the slide using a technique called Western blotting is the ability of a single dose of cocaine to cause the rapid induction, just a couple of hours, of many types of FOS-related transcription factors, FOS family transcription factors. Acute drug treatment induces delta FOS B only to a very small extent by comparison to these other proteins. However, chronic cocaine exposure causes a dramatic buildup of a modified form of delta FOS B and the relative lack of induction of these other proteins. Delta FOS B induction thereby describes a molecular switch whereby recruit, a repeated exposure to a drug induces this abnormal transcription factor. And we've shown that this induction of delta FOS B mediates sensitized responses to drugs. And I'll show you examples of how we've done that. 
This is again using the tools of molecular biology where we can generate a genetic mutant mouse or a transgenic mouse where, which is normal in development or in which we can turn on delta phos B or turn on an antagonist, a blocker of delta phos B selectively in the nucleus accumbens and related region. In the absence of cocaine, we can then ask how turning on or turning off delta phos B alters an animal's subsequent sensitivity to drug exposure. This is using the condition place preference paradigm where an animal learns to prefer a cocaine paired environment. Notice how normal animals where these genes are off, the gray bars, show a dose dependent increase in cocaine place conditioning, a response dramatically enhanced by turning on delta phos B, and a response dramatically inhibited by turning off delta phos B selectively in nucleus accumbens. And we can use similar tools to demonstrate that the induction of this master control protein is absolutely essential for the ability of cocaine and other drugs of abuse to induce the growth of this dendritic branches of nucleus accumbens neuron. The bar graph shows the ability of chronic exposure to cocaine, for example, to induce gen dendritic growth. This is looking at the number of spines on dendrites. I'll define what spines are in just a moment. The ability of overexpressing delta phos B, of turning on delta phos B to mimic the effect of cocaine, and the ability of this blocker of delta phos B to prevent the ability of cocaine to produce this effect. This panel here shows a single nucleus accumbens neuron filled with a green dye. This is the cell body of the nerve cell, and all of these other extensions are its dendritic branches. You can see where the name came from, since these dendritic branches really do look like the branches on a tree. If one magnifies one of these individual branches, you can see the images shown on the lower part of the slide, where each of these protrusions from a dendritic branch is a spine. And it is these individual spines that receive the incoming signals from other nerve cells to form synapses. Notice how delta phos B dramatically enhances the number of these spines uh, on these nerve cells, thereby mimicking the effect of cocaine. And we can carry out another series of studies to identify how delta phos B is producing this effect. If you recall, from the outset, I said that delta phos B is a master control protein that controls the levels of expression of many other genes, some of which are shown here, and each of which we've directly implicated in the ability of cocaine to control this growth of nucleus accumbens nerve cells. So this then brings us to uh, considering how we can mine this dramatically improved understanding of the neurobiology of addiction in order to develop better treatment. The first thing we have to recognize is that all current treatments for drug addiction are relatively limited. Unfortunately, most addicts are inadequately treated by available treatment approaches. And all medication treatments for addiction focus solely on neurotransmitters and receptors. Based on the material that I presented today and on uh, many more examples of other chronic, of other changes that drugs of abuse can elicit in brain reward nerve cells, the question becomes, can we use these discoveries of the role of BDNF, of the role of delta phos B, and of many other signaling cascades to generate new medication treatments. We believe that such a goal is essential. All of today's treatments, not only for addiction, but for all brain diseases, in fact, for all diseases in general, focus on perhaps a few hundred proteins, despite the fact that we know the brain itself contains perhaps several hundred thousand different types of protein. We need to break through this logjam of drug discovery 
and go beyond the few hundred of proteins and related to neurotransmitters and receptors to the many hundred thousands of targets that I illustrated in this lecture related to BDNF, delta Fos B, and other pathways, which we know are crucial for addiction treatment. Let me conclude by making the point that the goal of this effort is not to replace psychosocial treatments of addiction. A person who is addicted to a drug is going to always require rehabilitation, help to rebuild their lives. However, right now those rehabilitation efforts are fighting against very powerful biological forces which today's treatment approaches do not adequately counter. The goal of our research therefore is to develop more effective medications to more effectively counter those negative biological forces that drive an addiction to make an individual better able to make use of rehabilitation efforts and rebuild their lives. So I'll stop there. I will post a few questions uh, on the board, uh, but I'd be happy to answer not only these questions, but any others that you have. So thank you again for having me with you today. Eric, thank you for an extraordinary presentation on a complicated subject um, and just uh, but made understandable uh, to, to to regular people listening to it. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, I, I would say these are great questions and similar, you know, we, we've received a number of questions and these questions are, are similar. So why don't we go through the, the questions that you have for discussion. Um, and let's start with the, the first one that you put up um, about the legal status of, of drugs. Sure. Um, I would say that the, the question uh, is, the answer to the question would be based on whether different drugs of abuse are, have, in, have different inherent uh, rates of addiction. And that's a, an answer, a question to which we don't really have a clear answer, mainly because it's impossible to do the study. I could go to the University of Texas, for example, and give 1,000 people alcohol, 1,000 people heroin, 1,000 people cocaine, and see what percent of those people get addicted. I'd get arrested before I did that. So we don't have an answer to the question. However, based on observations in the field, we believe that opiates and stimulants are probably more addicting than other drugs of abuse, like marijuana, alcohol, and nicotine, so that the current legal status of opiates and stimulants might make some sense. But the current legal status of marijuana being illegal, whereas alcohol and nicotine being legal, probably makes less sense. How would you put into the puzzle of what you're describing um, the role, the, the risk that starting with, you know, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana may increase the risk that somebody would then move on to those other even more dangerous drugs? There's quite a lot of evidence in support of that idea. It's called the gateway hypothesis and uh, suggesting that uh, individuals' access to legal drugs, alcohol and nicotine first, and perhaps to marijuana, which is more generally available, does make it more likely that a person might advance to using a harder substance like uh, a stimulant like cocaine or opiate like heroin. Um, and in fact, we have to also acknowledge the fact that alcohol and nicotine, even though they're legal and less addicting, meaning most people in Western cultures will try alcohol or nicotine at some point in their lives and the vast majority don't get addicted. Despite that, the health impact of those two legal drugs far exceeds what we see with the illicit substances. So we do need to, um, I, I have to be very careful in terms of talking about alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana as being less addictive. Nevertheless, they, ex they exact tremendous costs on society, so we need to find ways to have people use them in less dangerous ways. So while tobacco might be less addictive, it certainly has a significant impact on people who are using it in terms of health risk. Exactly, yep. The, um, how does the, um, the role of genetics fit into
what you're describing with, um, with you know the the um, neurochemical changes that occur when you know the, the drugs are being used. So you know how does what is what makes one person more vulnerable than another? Yeah, exactly. So we still don't know the genes that comprise that 50 percent of genetic risk, um, but we can figure that the way those genes act is by making the brain more or less likely to show these kinds of responses uh, that I described in my lecture. More or less likely for heroin to shrink VTA dopamine neurons or cocaine to cause sprouting of nucleus accumbens in our cells. We know that's the case in laboratory animals. We can take mice or rats with different genetic backgrounds and show that those animals show different inherent tendencies to display these various molecular changes. Uh, so presumably the same thing is happening in humans, but we don't yet know the specific genes that make humans different. The, um, certainly we know that there can potentially be an increased risk um, in, in family members of people who have a diagnosis of chemical dependency. What types of steps should be taken to reduce that risk to you know, basically uh, steps of prevention for chemical dependency? At this point in time, the, uh, the best we can do is education and training. Uh, children of uh, parents who have or, or of families where there is a strong uh, incidence of addiction need to be very cognizant of, the, of their own risks. Uh, and, uh, I think we can do better than we are now of targeting those particular children or individuals and illustrating for them what those risks mean to them. Uh, you know, a child born of uh, parents who are alcoholic or with other addictions really need to understand that their experimentation with drug is much more dangerous than it is for their friends, perhaps, who, don't, who lack that genetic vulnerability. The, um, as you know, and as many people know, um, unfortunately, often many people have both chemical dependency and an additional psychiatric condition, such as depression or schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, etc. Um, how, how, how do you see um, that relationship um, between the two? Yep. We think it's bidirectional. So there is no question that an individual with another mental illness uh, might be at increased risk for addiction as they experiment with drugs of abuse in an effort to treat some of their symptoms. A person who's depressed, for example, might go to a drug of abuse as a way to alleviate depression. And the drugs can alleviate certain symptoms of depression initially, acutely, but that doesn't last long at all. At the same time, we think that drugs of abuse in some cases might make an individual actually more vulnerable to another mental illness. So in the case of depression, for example, as an addict uses drug and becomes increasingly addicted, one of the consequences of that addiction might be a syndrome of depression, whereas before their addiction, they were not depressed. The um, I'm going to go back to uh, one of the questions that you put up for discussion, which is how much alcohol is safe to drink? Well, it, it, I, I, the reason I put that down is I have uh, three children in their 20s, and it's been interesting for me to talk with them and their friends about uh, the amount of alcohol that is currently being uh, used in high school, college, and after college. And I don't think there's any question that uh, their generation is using far more alcohol than my generation used when we were that age. Uh, I think the uh, age limit of alcohol, as the, you know, the drinking age of 21, has had a detrimental effect because it has reduced access to alcohol and required kids to um, obtain alcohol in more surreptitious ways and consume alcohol in more binge drinking manners. So for example, there's something called pre-gaming where kids would drink alcohol in their dorm rooms where they can 
before going out. And they just drink as much as possible and get as drunk as possible before going out on campus where the use of alcohol might be restricted. Um, the, what, the amount of alcohol that's safe to drink differs from person to person. I do worry that today's teenagers and young adults are drinking more, which is going to be exposing a higher percentage of them to a concentration of alcohol that will trigger alcoholism or alcohol addiction, much higher than what we faced in our generation. I, I guess we're both um, showing off our age by yeah. our, uh, stating that we were in college when the drinking age was, was 18 and you could sort of more openly drink, which um, reduced the amount of this pre-gaming binge type drinking. Yep. Yes. Um, the, uh, and along those lines, you, you ask about um, the use of Ritalin um, and is it safe? And that's a question that often is asked when um, parents are considering whether or not um, their child should take such a medication. Yep, absolutely. And I think what we see in our country in the case of Ritalin, uh, which is methylphenidate, which has cocaine's exact mechanism of action by blocking the dopamine pump I mentioned earlier, the same would go for amphetamine, Adderall, which is also used to treat attention deficit disorder. Um, and amphetamine itself can be a drug of abuse if used in a different way. So this question of the safety of using stimulants to treat attention deficit disorder, or ADD, comes up a lot, and it's something I feel very strongly about. In the United States today, we see a disparity of usage. There are some uh, typically uh, affluent communities where the use of stimulants, Ritalin and Adderall, are sky high, 10, 20 percent of kids in high school might be on a stimulant to treat ADD. That's absurd. There's no way that a fifth of all students have ADD. I joke around sometimes by saying in those communities, ADD can be diagnosed anytime a kid gets a grade B in any subject, because the parent's expectation is that every child should get an A all the time. At the same time, we know there are other communities, typically poor communities where there's less access to medicine and less trust of medicine, where the use of stimulants is extremely low and, in fact, too low. So we know there are children who have ADD who aren't being treated. The challenge is that there is no, just like with addiction, there is no definitive way to diagnose ADD. There's no brain scan, blood test, genetic test. So ADD is diagnosed just on behavioral abnormalities. Kids in college go to the health plan, complain of ADD, they get prescriptions that they don't need, and so on. But we now have several decades, millions, tens of millions of people treated with stimulants over the last 50 years. So we now have very large databases of clinical experience with these drugs. And an NIH consensus conference a number of years ago evaluated that data and came up with very strong conclusions in which I believe very strongly. The first is that when ADD is diagnosed as carefully as possible, it has to be diagnosed behaviorally but with rigorous criteria. Those children do better when they're treated with stimulants than if they're not treated with stimulants. And in fact, their risk for developing an addiction syndrome is less if they're treated responsibly with stimulants than if they're not treated. So I think the real risk for addiction to stimulants comes when the stimulants are being used in kids whose ADD is not defined so well and people who use stimulants recreationally at much higher doses in order to get the desired effect. Kids in college who, stay, who take higher doses of stimulants to do well on exams or to stay focused in courses are putting themselves at risk for an addiction whereas a child or young adult who takes very low doses of stimulants to treat bona fide ADD are actually helping themselves. So for people who really need it and it's appropriate, it actually is protective. But for people who are misusing it, in, in my mind, and I agree with you, it's often misused. To me, it's almost like the misuse of steroids for athletes. Really yes, I think one, that, that's right. It could, yes, yep, you can see the analogy. Um, and along those lines, there's been a lot in the press and a lot of concern in, in, in our field 
about um, the misuse of pain medications. And I'd like to, for you in our remaining moments to say a little bit about that. Yeah, one of the fastest growing uh, cases of addiction is with prescription opiate drugs. So a few points to make. One is that there is really no difference in terms of mechanism of action among all the opiate drugs. Drugs like Oxycontin and Vicodin and Codeine that are used to treat pain act the same way as morphine and heroin. The only differences are whether the different drugs can be taken by mouth, injected intravenously, or so on. So people who use pain medications are putting themselves at some risk for addiction. However, by analogy with ADD, we know that when a person is in pain and uses opiates acutely to treat pain, their risk for addiction is actually quite low. And it is only with use of higher doses of opiates uh, for, more long, for longer periods of time does the risk for addiction increase. There is no question that people who have chronic pain syndromes are caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, and we don't know any easy way around that at this point. The opiates can be quite effective at treating their pain. However, over time, they become tolerant to those effects. The drugs wear off in terms of treating pain. Uh, so the people often increase the dose in order to get the same anti-pain effect. And as that happens, the risk for addiction, the risk for getting hooked, uh, increases and increases. We really need to find analgesics, drugs to treat pain, that are as powerful as today's opiates without producing that risk for addiction. Unfortunately, we don't yet have those medications. Eric, I, I want to thank you for an extremely informative presentation, and more importantly, for the work that you've done um, to move the field forward. It certainly, um, I think, offers great hope for the future um, for uh, chemical dependency and all psychiatric conditions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you. I, I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, the foundation, through its research grants, is dedicated to improving the lives of people with psychiatric conditions, including chemical dependency. Um, and I want to thank the people listening today for joining us in that mission. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family or friend, visit the webinar page on our website. Um, I want to mention some very exciting events that are coming up in the next few weeks. On Friday, October 25th, we have our annual Mental Health Research Symposium in New York. Um, more information about that can be found on our website. And that evening, we have our national awards dinner um, as well, uh, Friday, October 25th. And then in November, on, the on November 13th, we have our first annual women's luncheon. And it's entitled Women Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness. Um, again, information about that can be found at our website. Finally, I hope that people will join us next month um, for our webinar when we'll hear from Dr. John Crystal, a distinguished member of the Foundation Scientific Council, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale and chief of psychiatry at Yale New Haven Hospital. He'll speak with us about pharmacotherapy of post-traumatic stress disorder. And that will take place on Tuesday, November 12th at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Thank you all, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye.